The 19th century was a time of extraordinary social change. It was a time of the first and second industrial revolutions. Slavery was abolished throughout the Americas and Europe. The foundations of global mass communications were established with Morse's invention of the electric telegraph. The Trivithic steam locomotive heralded the worldwide expansion of land transport and Cayley established the basic principles of aeroplane flight. The field of science saw the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, the development of germ theory, most notably by Pasteur, and the establishment of atomic theory and the periodic table by Dalton and Mendeleev, amongst others. Electromagnetism was described by Faraday and Maxwell and quickly developed into electrical science and the foundations of nuclear science started with the discovery of radioactivity by Becquerel. It was also a high point in the arts. Monet, Van Gogh, Renoir and the other Impressionists revolutionized the use of color and light in painting. Mozart, Beethoven, Mendelssohn and the other Romantic composers expanded the expressiveness of music, dealing with more artistic and philosophical topics. Authors like Tolstoy, Twain, Dickens, Ibsen, Austen and the Bronte sisters revolutionized the field of literature. During the early part of the 19th century, another global movement formed, this one spiritual in nature. Within all major religious traditions, communities formed around the prospect of the end of times, the expectation that the events anticipated in their holy books were imminent. In Judaism, there grew a recognition that the predicted return of the diaspora was happening and that the arrival of the Messiah was nigh. Buddhists anticipated the coming of the Buddha Maitreya, the fifth Buddha. Hindus awaited the coming of the Kalki, the tenth avatar of Vishnu. In Christianity, the Adventist movements awaited the return of Christ. The Millerite groups in the U.S. formed and other Christian revival movements were established such as Mormonism, Theosophy, the German Templars and the Church of Christ Scientists. And within Shia Islam, it was the Mahdi, the guided one, forecast as a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, who was anticipated with the formation of Sheikhism. Ali Muhammad, who was later to adopt the title of the Bab, an Arabic word meaning gate, was born in 1819 in the city of Shiraz in Persia, now known as Iran. He was a direct lineal descendant of Muhammad and was born into a family of merchants. His father died while he was quite young and he was raised by a maternal uncle. He was sent to primary school for six to seven years, his only schooling, and then joined his uncle in the family trading business as a merchant in the Persian coastal town of Boucher. In addition to his business, he devoted much of his time to the study of Islamic religious texts. At the age of 23, he married Khadija Begum. They had only one child, a son, Ahmad, who died a few months later. Sheikhism, the Islamic millennial movement, had been founded by Sheikh Ahmad in Karbala, a Shia Muslim site of pilgrimage in Iraq. He preached spiritual renewal within Islam, predicted the imminent arrival of the Mahdi, and became a widely respected figure. After his death, leadership of the movement was passed to another, Sayyid Qasim. But during his leadership, the Islamic clergy began to oppose this movement that challenged their authority. Just before his death in 1843, Sayyid Qasim started to tell his followers to actively seek the Mahdi, who was now close at hand. During this period, Ali Muhammad went on a seven-month pilgrimage to the Shia holy places in Kabbalah, met Sayyid Qasim and attended some of his lectures. On the night of April 3, 1844, Khadija Begum, Ali Muhammad's wife, witnessed an event in their home in Shiraz in which he was bathed in a golden light. 
It was his first religiously inspired experience in which he recognized that he was, in fact, the Mahdi. It was in this new role that he took the title of the Bab. Seven weeks later, Mullah Hussein, a leading sheikhi, arrived at the gates of the city of Shiraz in search of the Mahdi. He had prepared a list of questions with which to test any claimant. He was met at the city gate by the Bab, who invited the seeker to stay with him. Mullah Hussein told of his search for the Mahdi and the questions he wanted answered. The Bab answered them all, then declared himself to be the Mahdi. He revealed a commentary on the chapter of Joseph from the Quran. That night, Mullah Hussein became the Bab's first disciple. Over the following five months, 17 others recognized the Bab. These first disciples became known as the Letters of the Living and were given the task of spreading the new faith across Persia and Iraq. With one of his followers, Quddus, the Bab left on pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, and it was at the holiest place in Islam, the Kaaba in Mecca, that he publicly claimed to be the Mahdi, repeating the claim in a letter to the Sharif of Mecca. After pilgrimage, he returned to Boucher. The preaching by the letters of the living had led to religious opposition, and under the influence of the clergy, the governor of Shiraz ordered the Bab's arrest. He presented himself to authorities in Shiraz in June 1845 and was immediately placed under house arrest. In September 1846, he was released due to a cholera epidemic and used the opportunity to restate his claim, this time from the pulpit of the Vakil Mosque in Shiraz. He stated that he was not merely Sayyid Qasim's successor, but a manifestation of God with divine authority. He was subsequently sent to the city of Esfahan, where he stayed with the head of the local clergy who was sympathetic to his claim and was supported by the provincial governor. However, following the governor's death, renewed clerical pressure made the Shah order the Bab to Tehran in January 1847 to meet with him. However, before the Bab could meet the Shah, the Prime Minister re-arrested him and he was sent to the prison fortress of Maku. His popularity in Maku grew quickly and the provincial governor became a follower. So the Prime Minister again intervened, sending him to the remote fortress of Cherik. There too his popularity grew, and his jailers relaxed restrictions on him. So the Prime Minister ordered him to Tabriz, and called on the town's clerics to try him for blasphemy and apostasy. The trial was attended by the Crown Prince, and involved numerous local clergy who questioned the Bab about his claims and teachings, demanding that he produce miracles to prove his divine authority, and admonished him to recant. His reply to them was, I am that person you have been awaiting for 1,000 years. The trial was indecisive. Some clergy called for execution, and Persia's religious leader issued a fatwa establishing the Bab's apostasy. But due to his popularity, the government wanted a more lenient judgment. They arranged for medical experts to examine him and find grounds for clemency, thereby saving him from execution. But the clergy insisted on some form of punishment, and he suffered the bastinado, twenty lashes to the soles of his feet. He was then ordered back to Chehriq. But the unrest caused by the growing movement spread, and in mid-1850, the Prime Minister ordered his execution. He was returned to Tabriz to face a firing squad. The night before, a young follower, Anis, begged to be martyred with him. He was immediately arrested and imprisoned with the Bab. On the morning of July 9, 1850, he was taken to the barracks courtyard, and in front of a crowd estimated at 10,000, including many international diplomats, suspended with Anis from a wall. 
A regiment of 500 riflemen gathered. Their leader, Sam Khan, told the Barb that, as a Christian, he wished to be relieved of his role as chief executioner. The Barb promised he would be freed from the task. Many eyewitness accounts report that the regiment took aim and the order to fire was given. But after the smoke cleared, it was seen that the volley had failed. The bullets had cut the rope, suspending the Barb and Anise from the wall. But the Barb was nowhere to be seen. He was subsequently found unhurt, completing instructions to his secretary. Sam Khan refused to take any further part and left Tabriz with his men. A second regiment was brought in under a Muslim commander, and the Barb and Anis again suspended. At noon, a second order to fire was given, and this time they were killed. Instantly, a sudden, severe wind arose, causing a dust storm that lasted from noon to midnight. The remains of the Bab and Anis were thrown by the authorities into a moat, but under cover of night were rescued by the Bab's followers, placed reverently into a casket and hidden. During the six years of his ministry, and for many years following, over 20,000 of his followers were executed by the authorities and religious zealots. However, the remains of the Bab and Anis were secretly transported over a period of 50 years, first to Isfahan, then Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut and Akka, finally reaching Mount Carmel in 1899. In 1909, the remains were finally interred in a mausoleum on the mountainside, and in 1953, a golden dome shrine was constructed and surrounding gardens planted that are now the pride of the city of Haifa in Israel, adjacent to the buildings of the Baha'i World Center. It is estimated that the Bab revealed 500,000 verses, about 80 times the volume of the Quran. Excerpts of these have been translated into English and other languages and published. His teachings focused on a reinterpretation of the Quran, challenging literal renderings and discussing its messianic themes. He also abrogated Sharia law, effectively nullified violent jihad, and instituted a year of waiting before divorce. He explicitly removed the need for women to wear the veil, and otherwise considerably improved the status of women. His prime legacy was his prophecy concerning him whom God shall make manifest, another manifestation of God who was to follow him. Three years after the Bab's execution, Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i Faith, fulfilled this prophecy. Most of the followers of the Bab subsequently accepted his successor. The Bab announced that humanity stood at the threshold of a new united era, stating, We have created you from one tree and have caused you to be as the leaves and fruit of the same tree, that haply you may become a source of comfort to one another.